O Lord, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with uh, verse 1 and following. Paul notes, if there is any paraclesis, so here it might be translated as in com- encouragement or comfort, uh, something like that. There's an encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation. There the word is koinonia. So it could be fellowship, communion in the spirit, any affection and sympathy. Complete, there the word is pleurosate, which is like a fulfilling. Fulfill my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition. Um, and, and their selfish, selfish ambition, uh, followed by the word conceit, uh, is coming from a word kenodoxian, uh, and that's empty glory. But in humility, uh, there the word is tapeno frunesen, uh, and that's like a humble mind, Count others as more significant than yourselves. So the the first three verses here. We are comforted by Christ. He parakaleos. He calls us to himself. After all, he is our good shepherd. And what do the sheep do? They hear the voice of the good shepherd and they follow him. So Jesus is always calling us to himself, that we would follow him, that we would receive from him the fullness of his righteousness, forgiveness, joy, and peace. He bestows upon us his Holy Spirit, through whom we have fellowship, koinonia, communion, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so the Trinity, but also that we would have this with one another. We have comfort and love poured into us by him. And these are needed not only for the Philippians, but also for all who are facing persecution. They need the tender mercy and compassion that the Lord gives to them. Paul notes that his joy is going to be fulfilled. Filled. Well, how how does that happen? As they are joined together with the mind of Christ, so that we will be counted, uh, so that we count ourselves as less than those around us. God, Christ, who is true God, takes on our lowly flesh to redeem us, giving this as an example to us. He did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as the ransom for many. And so this is what we're getting at when we're talking about being humble-minded. Now, selfish ambition and conceit are the opposite of that. And uh, think about this, that I think the word word conceit uh, is is helpfully defined by this Greek phrase, kenodoxian, empty glory. What are the glories of this life? Uh, the, the award that you got for winning the speech team competition, right? I still have my medal in a box. I have a very small box of things from my childhood and uh, kind of like when I was a teenager. That's there. I've got this uh, a medallion, uh, which my wife says makes me look like Count Chocula. <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. Um, and that, that was from when I was a, a Lincoln Scholar. Um, so what, what are these things in the end? Uh, when we go before our Heavenly Father and lay all of the glories of this earth out before him, what does he look at them as being? Nothing. They're empty. They're hollow. And so if this is our pursuit within life, these empty glories, then we can count ourselves as being empty people. And we shall be empty on the day of the resurrection. So uh, when, when you then begin to look at the, the accolades of this world, look at them for what they are. Not something that fills. 
Christ fills. When we hear the word humility, tape for nascent, um, we have to understand that, that there is this emphasis on humility within our society. Sometimes it's a true humility, sometimes it's a false humility. But it strikes against Greek and Roman thought of Paul's time. This is against manliness. The pagan man asserts his will. He forces it on others. They are compel compelled to do what he demands. They stoop down before him. The Christian, though, is to be humble-minded. And this begins first with the loneliness of the sinner before the holy God. When we come into his presence, knees bow. We bow. And we then mirror this within our worship, right? Within the divine service, there are reasons that, uh, at, for, for example, uh, when, we, when we hear glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, uh, we give a bow. Why? Because this is the name of God, but not only the name of God, a triune God, but also the name he places upon you for blessing. There's a reason that we kneel at confession and absolution. Because we are coming into the presence of the Holy God, and we're laying down before him all of the emptiness that we've pursued in the week. And he places upon us his forgiveness. He fills us with Jesus. There's a reason we bow and kneel at the Lord's Supper. For Christ comes to give us himself. And so we then are humble-minded, counting others as greater than ourselves. This is not a false humility. So the strong man, right, he doesn't go around pretending as if he has no strength. It is okay to confess the truth. I am a terrible basketball player. That's true. You can all see that on Tuesday night at 7, no, 6.30 p.m. You'll be like, that guy can run. But he cannot shoot. And then it gets to the fourth quarter or the third quarter. Maybe it's the second quarter. And you're like, that guy can no longer run. He did really well for the first eight minutes. But now he's terrible. Okay? So this is not a false humility. Pretending as if you have no intelligence and other people have more intelligence than you. Or if you are a, a talented musician, God has blessed you in that way. Pretending as if uh, others are better musicians than you. This is not pretend. Instead, and I think this is helpful from um, this R.C.H. Lenski uh, commentary here. Um, the humble one considers others as above himself. And so it is all around within the church. A marvelous community in which no one is looked down upon, but everyone looked up to. The very need of the needy lifts them up to receive the greater consideration. Uh, you can see a parallel to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul is writing about the body of Christ and those who are considered to be less honorable are deserving of the greater honor. Okay? In addition to this, verse 4 notes that uh, we should each look not to only to his own needs or interests, but also to the interests of others. Looking to the interests of others is, in fact, going through the fourth through ten commandments and following them. <laughs> it leads us from being curved inward upon ourselves to looking out. And seeing others in their time of need. As we move from verses uh, 1 to 4 into 5 through 9, we have a sedes doctrine, a seat of doctrine for the two natures of Christ. Okay? So let's hear from, from Paul in what, what is very hymn like here, in really verses 
5 through 12. Okay? Have this mind, and so there you, you heard humble minded before, tapeno frunese, or frosune, and now we have fronete, which is based on that same word for mind. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's not something that you have to manufacture and put on, it's given. Who? Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, this is rather marvelous, because right now what you think about, uh, man and woman in the garden wanted to grasp godliness or godlikeness, right? And here is Christ who doesn't just have like a form looking like God, which is maybe the way you hear that word. I know I've, I've heard it that way before. But instead, this is talking about Christ having the divine nature because he is the one who is both true man and true God. So Jesus, who is true God, doesn't have to reach out and grab godlikeness because he is true God. We can see that in the transfiguration as his glory is revealed to Peter, James, and John. And so Jesus comes to do which, that which Adam and Eve did not do. Though they were made in the image and likeness of God, they thought it was theirs to grasp from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that they could be God-like. Here Christ comes along and is perfectly obedient. Unlike Adam and Eve, he listens to all that the Father says, and he does it. Now, what's rather miraculous, and Paul hasn't gotten onto this yet, but uh, we understand this, that Christ is giving to us these gifts. Not only faith withhold, which holds fast to his perfect obedience, but also, certainly in the resurrection, we are like him. We don't have to reach out and grab something to be like God. Instead, he makes us fully like him without sin, with perfect righteousness in the resurrection. So, from here, um, reading on a little further, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Ha! Ah, now, now, this is a deliberate connection back to the empty glory, that conceit word, which we heard earlier. Because the word for emptying is related. Okay, before it was kena doxian. And now here, we're dealing with the verb ekenosin. So Jesus empties. He empties Himself, in what sense? Like he gets rid of his divine nature? No. That's not what we're dealing with here. Though some have used that as their point to teach false doctrine about Christ. Instead, Jesus Christ takes on his human nature in the Incarnation. Right? He is both true God and true man. But during his earthly life, he refrains from the full use of the power of the divine nature, which is communicated unto the human nature. In other words, it remains hidden, revealed at moments like his baptism, at the transfiguration, at the resurrection. It's no longer hidden, it's just fully revealed. And so then Jesus empties himself even puts aside his glory, so that you would be filled with glory. Now, isn't that interesting, the word interplay that's happening here, right? We have this idea that you're being humble-minded. Uh, we have this idea that Jesus is filling. And now we have Jesus who's emptying, but will be glorified, okay? Now, what we have going on there is certainly then this exchange, this great exchange between Christ and us that happens because he is our beloved groom and we his beloved bride. Paul goes on to note. Verse 7, emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. 
and we have an echo then of Christ coming to serve. Being found in human form, does that mean he just looked like a man? Again, heresy. No, we're not talking about just the looks. Instead, he has a true human nature. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death upon the cross. So not only does he empty himself, but he tapenoses, he, he humbles himself to suffer the, the death of a slave. Because that is what the crucifixion is. It's not the death of any Roman citizen or even most of the Jews, but it's the death of slaves. Jesus endures a slave's death for those who have been enslaved to sin so that you should be set free. Yes, you were once in the bondage of sin, but you are no longer bound because the one who is the truth has set you free. Going on now to the end of verse 8. He became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. <laughs> Jesus is not only perfectly obedient to the Father, he even dies for your sake. But in doing so, things become reversed so that death is now obedient to him. It has to cough you up at the resurrection. It can't swallow you down. What is mortal is swallowed up by life, not death. Therefore God has exalted, highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. We get to the end of this whole reversal that we've been talking about. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He who endured the cross and a slave's death is now glorified by the Father, having fulfilled the Father's will. He is exalted. His prayer that he would glorify the Father and the Father would glorify him is fulfilled in the cross and the resurrection and ascension. And at the name of Jesus, now we bow. Which kind of brings us back to where we started, right? What do we do in the divine service? We kneel, we bow. Even our body is being obedient unto this fact that Christ is in our midst. And our mouths, they bring forth the praises of Christ as we sing of his works. Verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, oh, more of this obedience talk, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul moves on to the Philippians hearing the Lord, because that's what the root of the word here for obey is. It's to hear and be under then the Lord in that hearing. So this is the life of repentance and faith, isn't it? This is what he's praising them for. Not that they've been morally perfect. Ah, you've always obeyed every rule I laid out. You're never like that child who won't get dressed. Come on. 
It's five minutes before we're supposed to be, fill in the blank. You need to put your clothes on now. And then it's only with much, I don't know, coercion that the child finally gets into his clothes. No, this is about faith. As well as the matter of working out your salvation. That makes it sound like it's up to us, right? But notice what immediately follows that. It's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God is doing the good work of saving us by his grace through faith. A faith that now continues to receive that which strengthens it, Jesus and his forgiveness. God is also the one who brings forth good works through us. No wonder. Paul follows the working out of our salvation by the working that God does. God works in us, bringing us to repentance, fear, and trembling before the Holy God, and faith that we would cling fast to Christ. And he gives us his Holy Spirit so that we would be raised, new men, delighting in the commandments of the Lord, desiring to hear and do his word. Grumbling and questioning. That's old Israel, isn't it? Now, if, if you were to, to look at those two words, grumbling and disputing, uh, you would find that they come up in some of the great events in Exodus, right? Well, where? Where the Israelites grumble against God because there's no bread. We're dying here. Uh, they begin dialoguing within themselves about whether Moses is going to finally come down from the mountain or not. And then we hear that same grumbling and questioning, dialoguing in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels with the Pharisees. So we're not supposed to be like them. Instead, we are to be lights. How do we be lights? How are we lit? Having the mind of Christ. It is Christ dwelling in you. That enlightens you. He's the light that lightens the Gentiles. He's the light that lightens you. You carry him out into the world. Paul hopes that he hasn't labored in vain. Huh. I think that's true of all of us. Especially if you're a parent. You keep hoping that the labor isn't in vain. And you have fears along the way, right? What's going to happen to my kids? What's going to happen to my grandkids? What's going to happen to my nieces and nephews? Have I labored in vain? Well, with the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Were there probably some in Philippi who fell away? Yes. Did Paul give up hope? No. Would some perhaps leave because of his persecution and their persecution? Yes. We've seen that through the Christian church throughout time. But, what do we keep doing? Holding fast to the word of life. We pray that the Lord would then strengthen us so that we are ever holding fast to Jesus and the Holy Scriptures. And, perhaps, like Paul notes here, we're going to be poured out as an offering. Well, maybe we'll endure suffering for the sake of the gospel. But let it be so. In the end, we are glad and we rejoice because we are not filled with emptiness, but we are filled with the fullness of Christ. We probably have three minutes for questions or comments. Jack? So you said it's him like, but uh, the scholarship has said that this, as the, this section uh, uh, from verse 5 through verse is actually possibly an early hymn, so that's pretty. And this is again, actually, really, this, these verses are actually a really hot topic right now in uh, debates about early high Christology. So, in other words, if you have most of the 20th century kind of liberal scholars said that the idea that Christ Jesus is divine kind of gradually developed. And so, so this is cited by newer scholarship over the last 10 to 15 years called early high Christology that says, well, no, look, in Paul, Jesus is divine. And if He's quoting a hymn that already existed decades, because these things take a while to develop, right? Decades before he wrote this, but 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, that obviously this was a common belief before that. So. Right. right. Which is 
when, when we see some of the hymns that pop up within the church now, what, what ends up lasting? The, the other like, thing yeah, on. yeah, just let me finish that idea and then, then go ahead. Um, that which is true and pure and beautiful lasts. So the campfire songs of my youth, <laughs> even though they stick around in my head, nobody else is singing them anymore. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that, Jack. Uh, I did not know about that scholarly research regarding the hymn that is, that is here. Yeah, yep. I mean, the other thing is, uh, is 1 Corinthians 8, where he modifies the, uh, uh, the Shema from uh, Deuteronomy 6 to include Jesus. And mm -hmm. a scholar I just read does work, there's a new emerging pursuit in biblical scholarship, numerological, because what they're discovering is ancient people phrase things using numbers to try to convey symbolic meaning. And they he discovered that there's 26 words in that kind of creole formula, and there's and then the numerical value of Yahweh is 26. Okay. So that's what interesting. So that, that is very interesting. Thank so you. So again, it would have been a creedal statement. He wasn't just making that up on his own. So the church already had a creedal statement, which somebody who knew Greek and Hebrew both knew Greek really well crafted. They just quoted from him that they already know. Right. Uh, which, which should inform our preaching in our present day, right? Uh, the preaching in our present day should interweave hymnody, the catechism, along with the scriptures in the overall sermon. And the reason I, I think that's the case is that it's always pulling these things from your past experience, um, as well as digging them deeper into your own mind and heart. Okay. Any other questions? But, yep. But under the earth, does that mean hell? Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, if I had studied more, I could answer your question easily, but I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> well, every tongue, does Satan confess that Jesus is Lord? Do the demons during the Gospels confess that Jesus is Lord? Yeah. Must they bow before him? Yeah. Do they do so with joy? No. Right. So, there we go. That's, that's my answer. Okay. Yeah, thanks for answering it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for sending forth your Son, who emptied himself for our sake, putting aside the use of his divine powers, suffering death, then rising on the third day, so that we wouldn't be filled with empty glory, but instead we would be filled with his righteousness, his forgiveness, and his life. Keep us, then, from seeking the things of this life, from counting ourselves as greater than as greater than those who are around us. Also, we ask, dear Father, that you would bring healing and restoration of uh, name to those who have been afflicted and affected by this recent controversy within the church. Pray for Jack and John and others who have been defamed by this. Preserve them as well as their families. And for those who have done evil, let them repent of their sin, that they would not come into your judgment. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.